right on the right next to you, just over there, press number one. Thank you. Wonderful. Okay. Uh, I'm happy to take questions. Uh, so I'm Andrew Sandberg from the Future Humanity Institute, and I'm wondering about debugging. Yeah. Uh, so, uh, thanks. Okay, Andrew Sandberg from the Future Humanity Institute. I'm wondering about debugging. It's bad enough with normal code, which is of course brittle, so at least when it crashes and misbehaves, it's usually possible to kind of trace the tra crack and see what went wrong. Here we're talking very complex systems that have not just a lot of parts, they're also very dissimilar. And in many cases, the part also get the representations from other parts. We actually learn from other subsystems. How the heck do we debug these kind of systems? So I think the issues are probably actually quite different for the kind of system uh, for an open cog versus uh, sigma. What the issues that are common are the interaction effects. When you have interaction effects, debugging becomes hard. And with cognitive architectures and artificial general intelligence, if you're going to reach there, you're going to get uh, interaction effects. And you hope eventually that mostly what you're doing is having the system learn and not your programming, and therefore that the debugging component becomes smaller. Um, with, with mine, again, I'm trying to keep things simple, but within that simplicity, I'm trying to get a huge amount of interaction. And therefore, no question debugging is tricky. Um, and so we build various kinds of tools to help us uh, dig inside the brain of the system and understand what's going on. Um, you can talk to my, my graduate students and stuff and see it's, it's, it's not easy. Um, but, what can I say? <laughs> it's the right thing to do still, to build these kinds of systems. So you've got to solve the hard problems that are necessary to make it work. Um, that, that's sort of the bottom line. Yeah, I mean, debugging, you may be using it in a fairly broad sense. So in, in terms of code level mistakes, I mean, we just, we do like any other large scale engineering project and we put a lot of unit tests th throughout the code. And that, that's one advantage I've found to developing OpenCog, mainly not using grad students in, in universities. Is we, we've had a number of students, we've also had a bunch of professional programmers and I think one point that's often overlooked is that building AGI is both a combination of multiple very hard research projects and a large-scale software engineering project. And there, there are practices associated with large-scale software engineering projects that are very rarely, very rarely practiced in, in academia among grad students. I mean, <laughs> we've tried to build OpenCog like a real large-scale software system which includes test-driven development and lots and lots of uh, unit tests for, for every, every part of the code. And of course, that never completely works, especially because we're using C++ for a lot of systems. <laughs> <laughs> but, so what, one thing we've done is shifted to using C++ for the core, and some parts of the system are, are Scheme and Python now, with, that, with calling on the C++ core. But that's all the boring kind of debugging, right? Which is making the code actually do what you think it should do. The, the harder kind is when what you thought the system should do isn't what you really want the system to do. And that's, <laughs> that, that's much harder to identify, of course, because unit tests are for each module in isolation. And they may make sure the functionality is what you want it. But then the, the behavior when you put the different parts together may not be what you thought it would be. And that ultimately, that, that comes down to whether the theory you had that motivated your building in the system was reasonably accurate or, or not. And if, if you had a good theory of what the components are supposed to do when you put them all together, then the behavior isn't going to be too far off from what you intended. And if, if you had a bad theory and you're just trying to mix and match a bunch of highly complex nonlinear components by trial and error, you'll probably get lost and, and, and won't succeed. So let me just say a touch more on that last aspect. And so, yeah, so Sigma's programmed in Lisp mainly by me in up to uh, university professor programming standards. Um, <laughs> but um, some of the hardest cases are where it produces behavior that you don't understand, you don't know if it's right, because even if you have a good theory, if things are complex enough in their interactions, you can't by hand figure out what's going to happen. 
And so you first have to figure out, is it doing the right thing and what you thought was wrong? And that happens often enough that it's actually a fairly interesting phenomenon. Um, one of the nice things about graphical models is if you do know what the semantics uh, is supposed to be on the top, then you know whether the behavior is correct or not, according to what the overall function is supposed to be. Of course, what I've then done is let you create this essentially bottom up by adding conditionals, and therefore the function is emergent. And I don't necessarily have a theory for what that function is based on all the knowledge you've added down below. So the ability to predict the interactions in those kinds of cases kind of disappears, and you've got to just go, go in there and do it. Uh, I have a short question uh, for you. Um, you have also seen Ben's aggressive timeline uh, with respect to finishing AGI and getting it all done. And uh, pretty much consequently, you very humbly announced that you are going to cover only a very, very small and narrow area that is uh, language production. And uh, you are probably aware that there are many university departments that expect to make a living out of this topic for like <laughs> the next century or so. Uh, do you expect that you are going to nail it uh, within Ben's timeline? This narrow topic? Yeah, I, I very much like your approach, so it's not critical at all. possible to solve the comprehension and generation problem like within say a couple decades or a hundred years and it's so why? Because um, my work is based on based on the open cloud platform. If the reasoning part is good enough then that will make the language processing much easier. <laughs> so I think uh, yes. So you, you think your approach reduces language processing to a mere problem of reasoning. So, <laughs> so as long as the guys doing the reasoning part do their job, then your part will work. Yes. <laughs> so th th this is the recursive nature of the system where each person can say as long as all the other people is part of it. Either they're all right or they're all wrong. Okay, man. We'll, we'll find out. <laughs> So in 20 years from now, we'll know whether it was 90% too big or a dead end. Well, if, if, you, if you pay attention to my time estimates, they're, they're, they're all carefully worded to be conditional on getting adequate funding. <laughs> <laughs> That's a very universal. <laughs> okay, uh, questions? I'll, I'll answer it. Yeah, hi. Uh, I'd be interested in hearing uh, Ben and Paul duke it out over one mechanism versus many. I mean, with one mechanism that can do everything, aren't you basically a programming language, you know, C++, and we're done? And with multiple faculties, how do you know you got enough? And how do you know the missing ones are going to play nice with the ones you already have? <laughs> <laughs> that microphone looked worked well. So, so that's a very appropriate question as to whether isn't C++ just the, the thing. Um, what turns out is the level of support provided by this kind. I mean, so an architecture does define a language by almost by definition. Uh, cognitive architectures are in analogy to computer architectures, and they, they define a language. The question is, what is the level of support of that language? Um, and what does it support easily and what doesn't it support well? So what you'd like to see, um, and which is one of the things we're sort of seeing with the models we build, is that we can find a good way of doing each capability, given this. So it has breadth in terms of the set of things that can be done, but it can't do each capability in an arbitrary set of ways. And when you get one, you get something that ought to be close to state-of-the-art. 
So it has a particular set of proper properties as a language, which makes it quite different from something like C++. What you want with a cognitive architecture is if it's the right kind of language, if you add, I mean, eventually you're not programming it, you want to be learning. And whatever is learned in it should be appropriately used by it, and you get appropriately intelligent behavior as a result. Whereas you don't get that with C++. There's no kind of learning algorithm you put in which whatever it learns will be appropriate in C++ and you get an appropriate behavior of a system with just C++ and the learning mechanism. So those are some of the kinds of differences. But, but it's a, a highly appropriate question. So first, I'll answer the question Paul asked me right, right before this question, which is what, what, what would be an adequate level of funding that I would be willing to, to stand by my aggressive time estimates? So I would say 15 to 20 good professional AI programmers working for 7 to 10 years should, should, should be enough, which is, is more than I have now. I have like 5 to 6 people work, working on this. And I think you, you need more than that, but I think you don't need like you don't need billions of dollars or hundreds of millions of dollars. I mean, okay, maybe twenty million dollars. Yeah, something like probably ten million. <laughs> million <dollars. laughs> like, you got you got ten million bucks for me? Uh, no. Right. <laughs> How much of that would be getting the requirements? How much of that effort would be getting the requirements specified? Um, about one year worth, I would say. I mean, we we have, we have a huge amount of, of work in, along those lines already, which you're not aware of. So, I mean, yeah, if if, if we had to rethink all the requirements from scratch. Of course, that becomes years to decades in an unlimited sense. So these time estimates are predicated on our basic design and approach being being correct, r r roughly correct. Not that every little tiny part ne ne needs to be correct. And so to get to, to your question now, what the hell was this question? <laughs> Uh, so mine was... Oh, we're supposed to do it out. Oh, this is going to be very boring, because I actually, I like, I like this approach. Oh, how I mean, do you decide when you're missing something? Yeah. Right? <laughs> I mean, I, I think there are many different approaches to making an, an AGI, and there are many approaches that could lead to different kinds of, of intelligences, and especially those of us who aren't trying to emulate the human mind in, in very close detail, there's going to be different ways that will lead to, to many different things. And the, the way I'm pursuing happens to be the way that, rightly or wrongly, I think I understand how to do it. And his approach seems intuitively plausible to me, but I don't feel I understand well how to do that in a way that would really scale up to human-level intelligence, as opposed to being a kind of small-scale model of human-level intelligence. If there's one thing to do it out over, I don't quite trust the message-passing architectures, which is one of the common factors between his architecture and SOAR, but then you could modify his stuff by replacing the message passing with some, with some more statistical Monte, Monte Carlo type stuff, and then we'll become closer to some of the things I'm doing. I mean, I, I think th there's a lot of different approaches, and there's a lot of people in this room. I mean, I think the stuff they're doing in Iceland could work. I think Josh's stuff could work. I, I, don't, I don't think AGI is necessarily hard in the way that many AGI skeptics think it's hard. It may, it may be hard in different ways, and it requires you to build a, a quite complex system do, doing a lot of different things and combine large-scale engineering with solving a dozen different difficult research problems in, in a coordinated way. If it has that kind of hardness, as opposed to the kind of hardness that, say, Margaret Bowden and Eric Sloman think, think it has, then there's going to be a lot of different approaches to engineering complex systems that, that bring about AGI. Some of them will be more unified than others. I mean, if you look in operating systems, say Linux, Unix is a more unified operating system than, than Windows, for example. But, and I happen to like Linux better than Windows, but both a more and less unified approach actually work to make, to make an operating system. And it may be the same with AGI. Let me just say a, a, a touch more. So one aspect Ben touched on is, and that I didn't focus on much, is that there are many different um, solution algorithms for graphical models. Essentially, take the same graphical model and you can use different algorithms optimized for different times. There's a question of whether you can come up with one general enough for a whole architecture, whether you need specialized ones. But there are all sorts of additional optimizations that can go into making all of that more efficient. Um, but in fact, I also I really like what both Ben and I are doing. I, I do what I do because for me personally, I don't feel like I'm making progress unless I feel like I'm getting at the deep underlying commonality among things. It's just a personality quirk. 
Um, there are lumbers and splitters in the world that goes back to the 19th century in biology. People who want to look at everything as uh, how they're similar, and some people want to look at how things in terms of, of how they differ. And that leads to different research strategies. What I think is key still at this phase of AGI is that we look at interestingly different approaches to it. And so I, I'm really excited about seeing what happens with, with, with Ben's work, where he's taking these <coughs> complex high-level components and trying to fit them together in interesting ways. And the question is, is that going to bypass all this little level stuff I try to do and show that we can accomplish it directly in that way? Or do we need to do it in the way I'm doing it? Or is it going to be neural networks? But what's a problem is when we're doing architectures that are too similar to each other, that we don't understand why it makes any difference, why we take one approach for another. But if we're searching the space in a reasonably intelligent fashion as a field, we have more chance of succeeding one way or another as, as we proceed. Uh, to push a little bit back to the original question, uh, in the previous session, we have seen one of, uh, of the, the preceding this one, uh, a point where somebody said it's not just about the architecture, it's about the content. And um, there's a similarity between languages and architectures. R has often been accused not to be an architecture, but a crippled down AI programming language, which is so general that you can do so much to it. This uh, similar uh, insult has been hurled at uh, SOAR to a much lesser degree, but still uh, all the architectures that are presented here are very general. There are two boxes in, in many ways. And what's the difference between um, in a paradigmatic toolbox and a fleshed out architecture in your view, view and in your architecture work? Sure. Uh, I mean, the open card system of which I'm one of the chief architects, does have that dual aspect. And when we created OpenCog, we sort of hoped it would serve as a platform for a lot of different people to build AGI systems on. And that turned out not to happen, but it, it turned out that thinking that way made a good platform for us to work on, because it helped us make it a very modular system that was easy to plug different components into and easy to experiment with in, in diverse ways. So. Thinking like a toolkit helped us make a good system, but yet what we found, when I talked to, to you, for example, about could you put your system in, in OpenCog, or could Paul put his system in OpenCog, you all could, actually. And there's no logical reason why MicroPsy or Sigma couldn't be implemented within the OpenCog framework, but it turns out it just wouldn't be the most convenient way to do either, either of those things. It, it would be awkward, it would probably be l less efficient. So empirically, it has, has seemed to me that I mean, I started with a conceptual, almost philosophical theory of how the mind works, and then tried to find a collection of computation algorithms that would realize that conceptual theory. And, you know, I built a toolkit that I thought would support a bunch of other things, as well as my conceptual theory, and found that it was more fitted to my conceptual theory than, than I thought. And I think the same has been true of a lot of other things, right? I mean, Lisp, they thought, was generic for exploring AI. But it turns out this was specifically, it in practice is better adapted to certain approaches to AI than others. And the same with, with Prolog, the same with, with a, whole, a whole bunch of other things. So there, it's, it, this was pretty neutral. <laughs> <laughs> with all the steps of the language. <laughs> <laughs> the most powerful language there is. Well, uh, we better not get into this. <laughs> programming language wars, we think we'll be away from right. the AI. Pascal is better. Um, <laughs> so actually, I don't see either what Ben or what I'm doing at this point is is all being like toolkits. Um, part of the reason I was ambivalent about assigning a name to what I was doing was because I wasn't sure at the beginning how flexible graphical models would be, and therefore whether it's building an environment for exploring architectures based on graphical models or a particular architecture. And I finally assigned it a name when it became clear that. There was room for exploration um, around it, but it wasn't arbitrary. And what I really was building was a single architecture. Now, Sigma is an example of what can be called a statistical relational language. Uh, these come out of statistical relational learning, where what you're trying to do com is combine first order reasoning of some sort, it might be first order logic, but it could be functional programming, or it could be something else, with full Bayesian reasoning of some sort, whether it's done in a graph or not. So there are a bunch of people building toolkits like that. There's Alchemy from the University of Washington. There's Factory, there's Blog, there's a, I'm probably a church. Um, these are all statistical relational languages. 
They really are about building toolkits. They don't have um, theoretical limitations on what they want. They want to be able to be able to build a whole bunch of components. You can build different models, and so you can do whatever you want with it. Alchemy has been talked about as a language for doing AI systems. It's just sort of the ultimate toolkit for AI. What I see, what we have is trying to bring theories of intelligence to these. Mine, I'm trying to learn a little bit about what, what graphical models will do for that. So I'm not coming complete top down because I'm still learning about what they can do bottom up. But in both cases, we're building a, the a language based on a theory of intelligence, essentially. And that's radically different from building a toolkit. Um, hi, uh, I have a highly speculative question, actually. You should say who you are first. Oh, um, I'm Sonam Bandri, I'm a student at Cambridge. Um, so, my question is, given the significant differences in the architectures that the two of you are looking at, if we assume that both of them do end up working, how do you think the resulting minds will be different in how they behave? <laughs> <laughs> I, I mean, the, the thing is that at this stage of OpenCog development, OpenCog itself could lead to so many different kinds of minds. I mean, our, our, our goal in the next, say, five years to, to be ambitious is to make a kind of robot toddler. If, if we're really lucky, like if, if our fundraising goes well and our research goes well and nothing screws up, in something on that time frame we could have a little handsome robot, a little robot toddler that kind of has the qualitative level of intelligence of a, of a three, or, three or four year old kid. I mean that's, that, 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 that's where we're trying to go and that, that, that in itself is very, very hard, right? And Setting aside timeline issues, if we just set that as an intermediate goal, to get a kind of, of robot toddler, whether it is five years as I hope, or, or 50 years, you know, once you go beyond that robot toddler, you can take that in many, many different directions. And you could, you could use the OpenCog architecture to make a system that was kind of autistic and obsessed with mathematical theorem proving and calculation. Or you could use it to make a, a more touchy-feely, compassionate system like, like David Hansen is, is looking at. And the, the architecture is sufficiently broad. I wouldn't say it constrains... But people are sufficiently broad. Uh, people, are not, people are not as broad as, as open <laughs> 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 Not individuals, but the humanities. I, 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 I don't think it's so. quite... No, I think that, the, uh, open, and that, may be, that may be a difference between our architectures. If, if yours is constrained on the level that people are. Because Open, open cog, for, for one thing, it has the notion of, of explicit goal content. I mean, you can specify the top level goals of the system, which don't 100% guide the behavior, but significantly guide the behavior. And humans sort of all have some built in biological goals, which, I mean, we can bypass them somewhat, right? We can fly kamikaze flights and then not reproduce and thus bypass some of our biological goals. But a lot of what we do, there, there's common biological goals. There's a common body we all have, right? You can put open cog system on the internet with no body just to read the web. You can put one in a humanoid robot. You can put one in, in a swarm of flying drones or something. I mean, each of these contexts would give a radically different mind. You could have one that was concerned primarily with mathematical theorem proving, or one that was controlling an army of, of Thai sex bots or something. <laughs> you can do so many different things that, that would lead to so many different kinds of minds. It's, it's, it's somewhat hard to constrain at this point. There, there may be limitations that are quite strict based on the architecture, and we have no idea what they are yet. I mean, what, what I've tried to think through very carefully is how to get the stage of, of a robot toddler. Because I think once you get there, then the rest of it is, first of all, will be radically better funded. Because once you had a robot toddler, a lot of people would get excited. Secondly, I think from there to various expert human level AIs is more straightforward by far than getting from here to a robot toddler. But since that part of the path is what I've thought through more, 
There may be limitations in the later part that I don't know much about. So that's a really challenging question. Um, I guess I can try to answer it at, at multiple levels. Um, the first is, in principle, one could imagine that there could be just any variety of different kinds of robot minds. There isn't just going to be one kind of robot mind that's going to be dealing with people. There could be a wide space of them. But, but then if you look at something like um, John Anderson's rational analysis, and the notion that people are actually, in some sense, an optimal adaptation to their environment. If that's the case, and if the robots are in the same environment that we are, then they're all going to be pretty similar in terms of the high-level behavior. They might differ in exactly the mechanisms that bring it about, but the behavior is not going to look too different. So in that kind of a notion that with Ben's system, if both of our systems work, they should end up looking the same if they're on the same kind of robots, for example, in terms of the behavior that you see. Uh, one level down, you still see that there, we ought to be pretty similar ultimately because we look at similar kinds of capabilities. We're going to be looking at perception and motor control and reasoning and planning and um, emotions and motivations. And yes, there are going to be differences, but I think you're going to see a lot of commonality because we're looking at the same kinds of things. And we're probably looking at them because that's what we get from people. There may be a bigger space we don't know about. If we go down to an even level below that, um, I can do my outrageous claim like, like, like Ben has made, um, which mine would be, I mean, if everything goes right with my architecture, then I would be able to do the kinds of things he's doing in this. So I look at what Edomir Errol's done, and I start to think about how would I do deep networks uh, in terms of the knowledge in this architecture with the processing being done by bus memory product. Could I do that? Can I do the other kinds of things in similar ways that will yield comparable behavior? Um, and if I wanted to be outrageous, I'd say, yeah, I can do it all. Uh, I'm not quite ready to say that, but that's, that's the kind of claim I would like to try. It's fun. <laughs> <laughs> um, those are some of our personality differences. <laughs> well, say it's, it's also much harder for me because I've got to figure out how to do them in this framework. I don't have arbitrary, I can't do arbitrary code to make it happen. So it's a discovery for me for each of these things. It was a discovery how to do reinforcement learning um, in Sigma, for example. Uh, hi, I'm Christian. I'm a philosophy and mathematics student. Um, I wonder how much are your cognitive architectures based on like philosophizing how the mind, how a mind can work versus how human minds actually work? Experimentally, yeah, that is. <laughs> um, so it, it varies by architecture. If you look at Actar, Actar has been predominantly about modeling human cognition um, with. Uh, actually, more recently, more and more sort of on the AI side. I don't know that they look much at philosophy. With SOAR, SOAR was kind of the dual of the ACTAR, uh, primarily looking at functional concerns, but keeping in mind um, psychological constraints and then trying to do some higher level psychological models, not the detailed kinds of ones that, that, that ACTAR generally did. Uh, again, not a lot of attention to philosophy. Uh, with Sigma, I'm approaching it more like SOAR. Um, so I'm focused primarily on functionality, but I keep in mind everything I know about human cognition as I'm doing it, and use it implicitly in guiding decisions I make. I'm not yet trying to model human cognition, but I'm hoping eventually to be able to do that as well. Um, I haven't found that the concerns from philosophy yet contribute to help me understand how to build architectures. If there are some things there that I should know about and don't, that would help, I'd, be, I'd love to learn about them, but I haven't found those so far. You know, my own quest to understand the mind probably started more with philosophy than with science, but that was like when I was a teenager. It was more with, the, with Nietzsche and Charles Peirce and Schopenhauer and Kant and a lot of Leibniz, the medieval Buddhist philosophers, Dignega, Dharmakirti, I mean, lots of thinking just how, how does the mind work? And that, that motivated like very base level thinking about the mind as a a system of, of patterns, which is recognizing patterns in the world and in itself and, and so forth. But that, that's extremely basic and, you know, philosophy of mind, if you get it right, may prevent you from going down a very wrong path in AGI. 
but it certainly doesn't tell you enough to, to put you on, on, on the right path. And I would say the same thing is true of neuroscience and experimental psychology you now. Even if you want to pay full attention to those things, they don't tell you nearly enough. That there, there's such humongous gaps in, in our knowledge right now. So if, if you're going to build an AGI, given the present state of knowledge, you have to combine pieces of knowledge from everywhere you can and then glue it together with a bunch of inspired guesswork and you have to have a really good intuition and guess right or you're not going to do it. So I mean, there, there's input from philosophy of mind and other kinds of philosophy, from neuroscience, from psychology, from computer science, from, from mathematics. And then, frankly, in the AGI architecture we're working on, all these factors are kind of opportunistically combined into an architecture we feel has some intuitive elegance to it. And that, that's all you can do now. Once empirical psychology or neuroscience have advanced a lot further, you could derive an AGI based on them. Or once the, the mathematical theory of AGI has developed a lot further, maybe you could derive an AGI arch architecture based on that. But there, there's no other discipline that tells you enough now. In OpenCog in particular, I would say the high-level cognitive architecture is heavily based on human cognitive science. I mean, in the sense, if you draw a boxes and lines diagram of OpenCog, which I didn't show today because of lack of time, but I've done, I mean, it looks about like what you would see in a, in a cognitive science textbook. I mean, you have, we have working memory, we have long-term memory, deliberative and, and reactive processes, we have metacognition, different kinds of memory that roughly correspond to the kinds of, of memory that have been in cognitive science. So that's, that's been fairly heavily psychology based and I mean I've observed in the last 30 years that I've been reading cognitive science literature, actually there's been more and more convergence on, on what these parts are. I mean it's not as highly trumpeted as advances in semiconductor technology or brain scanning, but cognitive psychology and cognitive science have actually advanced over the last decades and there, there's a lot more solid knowledge and agreement of how these things work now. Now what happens inside each of those boxes in the high level architecture diagram, we've drawn primarily from computer science. So the idea that declarative knowledge and procedural knowledge should be handled somewhat differently, that episodic knowledge should be handled somewhat differently, that comes from cognitive science. The fact that we handle declarative knowledge largely using a certain kind of probabilistic logic, fusing elements of predicate logic, term logic, and imprecise probabilities. I mean, that's not from philosophy, that's not from cognitive science. That's just from math and computer science, because it, it seems like a good way to handle large amounts of declarative knowledge, which are highly uncertain given the hardware resources it has. So, high-level architecture from cognitive science, particular algorithms from computer science. And the reason I think that's a good way is because the computing infrastructure that we have on the hardware level and the software tools level bears pretty much no resemblance to, to the human brain. So you wouldn't expect that the most tractable and efficient ways to handle declarative knowledge on current computer hardware have anything to do with the way the human brain and mind do it. I mean, we want to do these things in a way that exploits the von Neumann architecture and the computer networks that we have well. And that's going to be different than psychology. Now philosophy, in most cases, is broad enough and applies to every possible case. On the other hand, by the same token, that, that doesn't tell you very much about, about what specifically to do. Because one final lesson that probably everyone who's working on AGI has learned is that AGI is, is very largely about efficiency, about space and time efficiency. I mean, Marcus Hooter and Jürgen Schmidt were shown moderately convincingly that if you had an infinitely powerful machine, you could achieve AGI using a very short Lisp or Haskell program. I mean, you could, and you, could, you, could, you could optimize any computable reward function of any computable environment using a very small program, AXC or the Gordon machine or whatever, and we'll hear talks tomorrow morning in, in, in that general direction. So if you buy this at all, and there's various arguments about it, what it means is that general intelligence is basically an efficiency problem. It's about how do you do things using the constrained resources that you actually have. And not much <laughs> philosophy has grappled with that, with that sort of issue yet. Maybe the philosophy of the future will. You need philosophy. <laughs> <laughs> um, I remember that Aaron uh, wrote 
I think it was in the uh, 80s, that uh, there is a danger that uh, if philosophers don't learn how to program, uh, that they might become irrelevant for uh, what we do and for uh, philosophy of mind in some sense. And there is a danger uh, that, that he was right. And, uh, well, um, I do think that we have to fill a gap here, certainly. And we have to fill a gap between these disciplines and integrate knowledge over these disciplines. Uh, on that note, I would like to end this session tonight. Uh, I thank you after a very long, hard day for your attention, for interesting and uh, often spirited discussions. And I would like to thank the speakers for very, very interesting talks, um, full of new ideas for me at least. And uh, let's have dinner together. Thanks.